Well, good morning and welcome to the first lecture of this course, Computer Organization and Architecture. So this lecture will be an introduction to the course. We already have seen some of the um, you know, modules that will be covered in the previous lecture, but officially this is the first lecture of this course. And uh, in this lecture, I'll be introducing you to the fundamentals of organization and architecture. We'll try to understand the meaning of these two terms and we'll try to know what exactly uh, we are looking forward to in this course. Okay, so that is what uh, I will be covering in this lecture. Okay, so a bit of uh, information before we officially start. I already have uh, uh, explained to you how we will be proceeding in this course. Though there are two course websites, one for the theoretical lectures and the tutorial, and the other one for the lab. Okay, so they are mentioned here. You can just have a look. They are already created. In addition to that, we have already created for you a Google Classroom, where uh, all the announcements related to the course will be provided. And uh, all the assignments that will be that you are supposed to do have to be submitted via the Google Classroom. So, in addition to these two course websites, you are supposed to get yourself registered, and time to time you'll be provided with different uh, valuable resources that may be through the course website or maybe through the Google Classroom page. And all your submissions will be through Google Classroom, as well as the quizzes will be conducted via the Classroom. So you're supposed to register yourself. These are the recommended books. I would be, uh, I would expect all of you to have at least one of them. Primarily the first two. So this, though I have written it as in uh, as a list, but um, yes. so though they have been provided as a list. They are not in a specific order, so you can purchase any one of them, but it's better that if you keep the first one of the first two references that have been mentioned. Okay. So we will cover a lot of topics from each one of them. Uh, so it's better to have at least one of the reference books. Okay. Uh, in addition to this uh, references, I'll also be providing you different uh, slides and the different different uh, resource materials from these textbooks, which are available. Okay, so try to get any one of them. The first one is the book by Hennessy and Patterson, Computer Architecture, Quantitative Approach. Then we have Amateur's book, Amateur Venice Computer Organization. William, uh, the third one is Computer Organization and Architecture by William Stallings. And the fourth one is Architecture Organization by J.P. Hayes. So these are the books that we'll be providing, uh, we'll be uh, treating them as textbook and references. So uh, as you know that there is no replacement for books. I will be providing you slides, different um, links, etc. But a book is a book. So the slides that will be provided will only provide you the key concepts. Book will provide you the details. So I would expect all of you to please read the textbooks. That is in detail because in one hour or two hour lecture, it is not possible for me to cover all the details. So I'll only touch upon the basic concepts. I'll try to go as much as possible into the details, but there are limitations time constraints, so you are expected to go through the details in the book. Uh, there are, we will be providing you lecture notes, and there are ample resources on the internet. Provide them, use them. I've already given some links in the course website. Have a look at that. So there is a wonderful link that has been provided in the course website. Visit that, you will find a lot of information. So the idea is that through this course, you'll be able to visualize programming in more details. So you already have
session of uh, teaching you this course and the first component will primarily be devoted towards making you understand how a program gets executed on a computer and finally with this idea the motivation would be to build our own computer even if it happens to be a very toy computer but can we build our own machine so that is what we call designing and for designing we will be using again a very very beautiful book which is uh, um, called elements of computing system building a computer from first principle the book is available in the form of ebook as well but most importantly what we will be using this book for is in the lab okay so this is what we will be using in our lab we will use two simulators first one is a simulator for simulating the instructions written in uh, for the mips architecture it's called mars so that is the first lab that we will start off with understanding of the uh, mars simulator and the second one is again a simulator for understanding the arm assembly language arm that's again uh, class of instructions or a machine which has its own instruction set it's i don't know the arm in, the arm processor today is almost in every gadget that you work with be it in your mobile phone or any you know uh, gadgets that you are working the smart watch the tablets the laptop or whatever so arms are or in, in fact the different uh, you know small embedded devices that you are working with if it happens to be an embedded device uh, in all probabilities the processor that is inside will be an arm processor so we will look at how an arm processor what is the instruction set of an arm processor and how can we write programs for an arm processor okay so that is the lab resource that we are going to use these two simulators simulators in the second component we will move towards a different aspect of this course more towards design and there we'll talk about how to you know build things how to build the different components of a computer how to integrate them to build our own machine okay and, and the way to do it is from scratch is so we will ap apply a bottom up approach okay Hello, sir. Your voice is breaking, sir. Hello. Okay, so as I was talking about what we are going to do in the design part of this course, so intention is to build a toy computer from scratch. So this will give us an idea how one designs a computer. Okay, and for that we will be taking help of this resource it's called nand to tetris it's a project that is designed by a group and their intention is to teach people how to build computers from scratch it's like you have a nand gate that's a primitive gate and from that you keep on building things and finally you end up into building a full fledged computer your own computer so they take up both the aspects. Have a look at that. So, if you let me show you what exactly uh, they talk about, that's a very interesting resource. And uh, let me show you. Okay, so let me share the browser. Okay, here it is. So this is the uh, project which we are going to take up. So I would recommend all of you to please visit this page. And this is the uh, project that will teach you 
how you build things from scratch okay so it has everything that you need to know that are these are the projects and they are the people who are uh, involved in all this so it's a book by mit press and it covers almost everything that you need to know for building a computer your own computer okay so it takes up two aspects the hardware as well as the software hardware is where you build your own uh, computer and software is when you would like that computer to work so you know that a uh, blank hardware it it doesn't make any sense uh, until you use the hardware for a particular purpose and the way to do it is by writing programs or by using some software so software is a mechanism to make a computer work so you have to when you build a computer you have to look at both the aspects the hardware as well as the software so this is the book that i am referring to have a look at that we have a lot of softwares which are available so you can download them it's available for different platforms so if you feel like then there are different demos which are given so you can have a look at that we'll we'll cover all this in the lab so there's no need to worry okay so let me uh, come back to my slides well so this is what i plan right so this is our final aim to build our own computer to understand how computers work and then we'll also talk about uh, a language which is called verilog so we will be using uh, this is a simulator for you know simulating simulating means you will not be building the thing and you will not be doing that uh, physically but you will create a model of this say for example you would like to build your computer you will be building a model of that and then you will be checking in the software you will build the model in the software and you will be checking whether it works correctly so this is called simulation so we'll be simulating different very log models and when i say very log i mean this is a language that we will be using to build our different models so this is what we are going to do okay and as you see this is the interface uh, of model sim on the left hand side you see we have this is the project that will be built this is you see a very graphical way of building things it's like a black box kind of thing you drag drop and this window is the equivalent you know coding part the code of this design so you build the design in the most top level using some figures the equivalent code is generated this is the behavior or the functionality of the code it's called the flow diagram state diagram whatever you call it and then you provide some inputs and you check whether the inputs are correctly working according to the logic that you have developed so this is what the output gets generated and you do look at the output in form of a wave form to see whether the correct values of the binary correct the correct binary values of input up when applied gives you the equivalent binary output and whether the outputs are matching to your expectation so this is what we have as the resources for this lab okay right so what is this course all about the course is all about what are the components of a computer and how do they work because we are planning to build our own computer so to build that you should know what is inside a computer and how do these com components they work when you write a program what happens so this is what is the second question that we are going to answer how to program a computer you know how to write a program okay but how the program actually gets executed inside a computer we'll talk about that in brief today itself the second the third problem, uh, question that we are going to answer in this course is well when i work with different uh, when i write some programs and i want to solve a problem the computer does it for me but i have to give a data to the computer so when i give a data to the computer how do i store the data what are the different ways of storing the data in the last class i asked you a question that when you write something in c you give a data type to that so what is the significance of this data type what do i mean by this 
So we'll try to understand how to store different kinds of data in a computer. There are different variants of various various kinds of data we will be dealing with. Some will be integer, some will be signer, some will be character, some will be floating point. How does the computer store that? We'll have different representations of. That. Then we'll be trying to answer. Okay, I know how to run a computer. How to run write a program? I know how the computer works on that program. How does the program get executed? But can I make that program run faster? Because ultimately what we want to do is I want to use the machine to solve my problem. But can I solve it in a more faster way? What are the different tricks that I can apply so that I can run the program faster? We'll see a lot of them. Some of them, the most important of them will be technique called caching, technique called pipelining. So these are different kind of innovations that you bring about to the motivation is to run a program faster and faster. We want to quickly do our task. We don't want to wait. So how can I make these uh, you know, innovations in my architecture or different kind of tricks I can uh, play so that these programs can be run very fast. Then we'll talk about how can I take multiple such computers connect them together and solve a problem okay i see that i i have a problem that takes say t amount of time to solve it in a single processor if i have a single computer my task takes t amount of time the obvious you know intention would the intuition would be let us take similar computers okay let's say three of them or maybe four of them and let's try to take the same task and see how much, how quickly can all these four complete it. I may find that, well, this gets completed in T by four time. Okay. This is called parallelization. You take the task, you parallelize, that is, you split it up into number of independent or you know, same kind of uh, streams, and you allocate them to similar kind of computing units. So you run your, or you complete your task faster. So this is called parallelization. So the idea of using multiple processors would be to complete the tasks in a faster way. So what am I doing? I'm taking more resources and I'm reducing the time of execution. Okay, so this is the trade-off. So how do they work? How can these processors work? How will they be connected? Will they be independent? Will they be connected among themselves? How will they work? So this is again a very interesting part that we should discuss because today we have actually moved from a single processor system to multi-processor system. Okay, so this is the evolution that has happened. So we should know how they, how multiple computers or multiple processors they collaboratively work. That's the challenge in itself. Then we will also talk about different kind of specialized architectures. They are called graphical processing units. These are different processors that are specifically designed to handle floating point operations. Okay, so we call them floating point operations or flops. What are they? Well, I told you that data is of different kind, isn't it? Data can be integers, data can be uh, characters, data can be floating point units. Floating point means real numbers that contain decimal part as well. You already have seen that in your programming classes because you cannot use all operations with all kinds of data. Okay, that has to classify. So when I'm dealing with mainly floating point data, the different operations that I will be performing such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So these arithmetic operations that I will be doing on this floating point data, if you do that by the same you know, computer that you are using for integer operations, you may not get that same efficiency. It will take a lot of time. You may end up into a lot of errors. So the units that are there in general computers, they may be able to do these operations, but not efficiently. 
you can make things better. So what we do is we target different specialized architectures, which will typically be used for performing these kind of arithmetic operations on floating point data. Because they will be specialized for that purpose. And they will be working together with the computers. That is, they will be working together with the normal processors. They are not independently working. They are working as a co-processor. That means this processor will have a GPU core. Okay. Whenever first floating point operations have to be executed, the CPU will instruct the GPU to do that and get the results back from it. So that is what will happen. So this is called a co-processor. So we will see how these kind of GPUs are used, why are they used, and how they can be, uh, how they can work in tandem with the processors to solve different floating point operations. Because if you look at different applications such as image processing, etc., majority of the applications are related to floating point operations. So specialized hardware have to be developed to make or to operate on these op uh, on, on these data and in a faster way. Okay. So that is what we are going to see. And finally, as I told you, our aim is can I build my own computer? If tomorrow I would like to be designer of a hardware, or if I would like to build my own uh, PC, can I do that? Can I design my own computer? When I say design, I don't mean assembling. That's not the part of an engineer. When I say design, when I say build, I do not mean integration or assembling of different parts. No, I'm talking about designing the chip. Okay. So that's what my intention is to build your computer and I say build I mean both the hardware and the software aspects and more so there are that's an ever growing field today as we have moved towards you know artificial intelligence and machine learning era there must be hardware that are going to support that because an algorithm or technique or application or software whatever you develop will ultimately has to be implemented on a hardware so an algorithm, however good it may be, if it does not get a hardware support, it does not get its efficiency. So on one side, when people have started designing or started taking interest in these kind of you know advanced or data-driven applications, it was only when it was supported by equivalent hardware, that is very fast CPU and GPUs, that this particular field started increasing or flourishing. It was already there. These algorithms are nothing very fancy. They are nothing but you know, statistical measures, that's all. It was already there two decades or three decades ago. But they were not popular or they were not applied in different fields because there was not sufficient hardware to support them. Once with the advent of GPUs and very high multi-core architectures, these algorithms can be implemented now it can they can be implemented and we can obtain the results very fast so the computation has helped these algorithms to be implemented and that is the reason why people have started um, a renewed interest in machine learning stuff to solve different problems so it's only when the hardware has come to its rescue that they have found popular so that is all about what we are going to talk about in this course, and there is ample things to talk about. We will be restricting ourselves primarily to these points. Okay, so let's begin then. So what is a computer? Well, Wikipedia says that it's a machine that can be programmed to carry out sequence of arithmetic and logical operations automatically. A very important thing to do understand it is a machine number one yes it's a machine what is why what is the role played by this machine it helps you to solve problems so it's a machine that works for you to solve a problem and how does it perform all that it carries out different sequence of arithmetic and logical operations 
I mentioned that in the last class that whatever a computer is supposed to do, right from a very, very minuscule job, a very simple job to a very, very advanced stuff, let's say adding 10 numbers to a weather forecasting or let's say face recognition or speech recognition. So from a very small mundane task to a very, very fancy stuff, fancy problem, whatever be the case, the operation that finally has to be done is nothing but some plain arithmetic operation or logical operation. So if you, you know, elaborate the problem, that this is the problem I have to solve. And if I say that, okay, just uh, write the problem in terms of some tasks that you have to do, what you will find is the tasks are nothing but some arithmetic tasks and some logical tasks. That's what it is. So a computer is nothing but a machine that operates or performs some arithmetic or logical operations. And by doing so, they may be, you know, these arithmetic and logical operations can be um, a limited one or it can be a large one, whatever it is. You have to execute these in sequence over, a, you know, over and over again. And that will solve your problem. Okay. On the right hand side, you see, so modern computers can perform generic set of operations known as programs. So these programs enable computers to perform a wide range of tasks. Look at, look at on the right hand side, the different kind of computers that we have today. And one among them, the first picture that you find is the oldest, which was primarily of mechanical parts. Idea is the same. A computer does nothing but some operations, nothing more than that. Whatever be your problem, it finally has to be reduced to executing a set of instructions. How you execute that is up to the device that you have created. If you have created a mechanical device to execute the operations, well, that's a mechanical computer. That is what it used to be in the early 50s or 60s the first black and white picture that you see here. They gradually gave rise to other computers where computers became smaller, different semiconductor materials came up, and gradually they moved to a Uh, just a device to communicate. It is basically a computer today. So a mobile phone today is as good as a computer. In fact, if you look at the current day phones, you have multi-core architecture in that. Okay. So Okay, so that's that is what is mainly something that is expected to solve our something that is, okay. Well, so that is the uh, computer for you. It's a computing machine. Okay, the, ex the computer is expected to help you in solving a problem. Remember, it is as intelligent as the person who is trying to solve the problem. Okay. So the idea is that if you have something to solve, you create a pattern to solve that. That's you, you create a solution to the problem, which we call the algorithm. And you program that into the computer. Okay. And then you provide the input to the algorithm 
onto the machine. And the according to the algorithm that has been designed or the program that has been written to the computer, the computer will work to solve the problem. And given that particular inputs, it will generate some output. Now, when you get the output, you will check whether the output matches to the output that is expected of it. So this is nothing but a validation of the solution. So what the computer is helping you to do is it is trying to validate whether the solution that you have devised of the problem that you want to solve, whether the solution is correct. Clear? So the idea is that we have something in mind. Let's say I have a problem to solve, which is like finding the maximum of 10 numbers. Okay. I know how to solve the problem. I design a solution for that. I write it in a ordered way. I call it an algorithm. Then I write using some language. And I call a program. And I put the program into the computer. And I ask the computer to validate whether I have written the correct problem or program. How? I give some inputs. They are called test cases. And the program, uh, the computer, it runs the program taking one test case after another. And for every test case that I pass to the computer, an output is generated. When the output is generated, I check whether the output is as expected. If it matches for all the test cases, I say that the algorithm is correct. This is what a computer is supposed to do. Right? So a computer is supposed to uh, solve a problem. It, it's not it is not magic that it is solving the problem. It's actually helping you to validate whether the solution to your problem is correct. Okay. What can a computer do? Well, it can determine if a given integer is a prime number. It can, given a string, it will be able to determine whether it's a palindrome. Given two cities, and let's say the total number of, uh, the given a number of cities and uh, the cost to travel, it can give you the solution to the shortest time for traveling between, for travel between two cities. What is the path that you should take so that you can travel between two cities in the shortest possible time? You can use a computer to control your missile. You can use a computer to um, recognize fingerprints. It can be used to play chess develop games, it can be used to recognize speech, it can be used to recognize languages. So a computer can do all this stuff. But is it that the computer is doing all this? That I give any speech and it is able to recognize? No. What the computer is going to do is, it is help you, it facilitates the user to check whether the device solution is correct. Well, you may say that today we have a computer that uh, helps me in recognizing. How does that? It's not validation. It's doing something more. It is trying to classify or it is trying to, you know, um, apply different machine learning stuff. Yes, that works. But again, that is a data driven approach where it is trained. It's trained by some existing data and that data by, by once it gets trained, only then it is able to execute on the untrained data. So here again, there is something that has to be done only then the computer becomes intelligent. Okay. Well, you may argue, so if I am designing the problem, I am providing a solution, what is the computer doing then? What do I need the computer? Okay. So the need is, because there is a gap between human efficiency and machine performance. Okay. So the question that I am proposing is if I am devising the solution, why do I need a machine? Well, the answer is I need a machine because the machine can perform the same task that I would have to do 
in a lesser time and to some extent more accurately. Let's take an example. Compare a task of sorting 1000 numbers when you are going to do that and when a machine is going to do it. So if you want to sort 1000 numbers, there is a specific technique by which the problem has to be solved. What is the technique? The technique is that if I'm given some numbers, let's say from 1 to 100, 1099, uh, 105 in this way. So things are what you do is you take to find the uh, uh, max of that or or there are different kind of uh, algorithms by which you can arrange them. Okay, so you keep on first. Let's say you find the mean. That's one from out of that you find the mean. Then you find the next mean. Then you find the next mean. You go on doing that and you arrange them in this order. That will solve the problem. Okay, yes, but that will, but see the amount of operations that you have to do. First, you have to find the minimum. So you will be scanning the entire list and then finding the minimum out of that. We'll keep that. Then again, you will be repeating the same step for the rest of them. Then again, you will be repeating it for the rest of them. So you are actually doing the same task over and over again, finding the minimum. Except that the number of numbers which you are working that is reducing. First time you are having minimum of thousand numbers. Next time you will be iterating it over nine hundred and ninety nine numbers. Then you will be doing it over nine hundred and ninety eight numbers. But the task is the same: calculation of minimum. Just that the data on which you are working that is reducing. Okay. So if I'm doing the repeat things repeatedly, why should I do it manually? Why can't I give a machine to do it and tell that your job is to calculate the mean just that your data keeps on decreasing? It will do it faster. So that is the basic idea that the computer clearly outperforms the human in terms of executing the repeated tasks. Okay, don't take that. And this is where a computer works perfectly. I need the computer. Okay. Any questions so far? Class, is it okay, everyone? Yes, sir. Is the motivation for the course clear? Yes, sir. What exactly are we heading towards? Let's. Yeah. Since we now know that okay, computer is a machine. That is going to help us in solving problems. What is inside a computer? Okay, so this is the basic block diagram of a computer and we have been knowing about this from um, your school days. Okay, so you know that a computer is nothing but um, integration of a number of components. What are the components? The main component of this is called CPU central processing unit. A computer is nothing but a machine that processes or computes something. Processes what? It processes some data. So there must be a unit where processing will happen. What is processing? Processing means some operations will take place. What kind of operations? They can be arithmetic operations or they can be logical operations. So by processing, I mean some operations. We just argued that a computer is a machine that uh, performs some operations. So this is the unit where your operations will happen. Okay, but these operations cannot happen randomly. They have to be organized. They have to happen in a sequential way or in a ordered way. So there is a unit that controls the operations. There are not one, but many, many operations that have to be done. So this is operation number one, operation number two, operation number three. So in this way, so the order in which they have to be executed is decided by the control unit. So together, this is the part where the processing happens. The operations have to be decided. They have to take place and the order in which they will be executed have to be decided. That's the role of central processing unit. We often call it 
in common terms the processor. Okay, say some call it microprocessor, a processor. So this is the one that is the one that it will solve. Fine. Well, in addition to that, you also need storage. What is what? Why do I need store? Why do I need to store? See, there is an order in which you will be working with the operations. Okay, O1. When you are working with this operation, it may require some data called data one. Now, the second operation O2 may require some other data, data two. Okay, so these operations that you will be working with, they have to be stored somewhere. The data that you will be working on these operations, they have to be stored somewhere. Or how will the CPU or the processor work with that? So they have to be stored somewhere. So this is the storage unit where you store the operations as well as your data. And this is what we call the primary storage. Well, that's called the storage. Now there are two kinds of storage. One that stores these information temporarily and the other one that stores this information permanently. Why temporarily? Because when the CPU wants that, they are stored in this temporary storage, both this one, this list, and this data list. Okay, so they are stored temporarily. And there is another storage which stores the same information permanently. Okay, why? We will talk about that. But for the time being, let us just understand that there are two kinds of storage units. One that stores these operations or instructions and data temporarily, and the other one is stores it primarily uh, or permanent. Now, why? The reason is that these permanent storage they are slow. They are permanent. They store that persistently, but they are very slow. They are electromechanical devices, very bulky, lot of huge volume, lot of data can be stored. But if you would like the data to be available from here to the CPU, it will take a lot of time. That's not a good thing to do. Because this is mechanical part or electromechanical, and this is a semiconductor material. So they have a speed mismatch. It will take a lot of time to send the data from here. Can I have someone sitting in between that is much faster? This, this is the faster one. Okay, so it's a faster memory. So what you do is these instructions and data are first loaded from here to here and then the CPU gets them from the primary storage, not from the secondary storage. But primary storage is temporary. Why temporary? Because if you remove the power, if you take away the power from this storage, the data that is stored gets lost. But why do I need that? I need it because it's very fast. So CPU and primary storage, they interact. That is shown by this line called data flow. Data move from storage to CPU or from CPU to storage. So CPU interacts, CPU, the processing unit, it interacts with a memory. This is how they talk to each other. Okay. What does this memory contain? It contains these operations that you are expected to execute and the data for using those operations. What do I collectively call this? I collectively call this as a program. So what does the memory hold? Memory holds a program, right? What is a program? Program is a collection of programs and instructions that I want the CPU to execute along with data. That together is a program. And that is what is residing in the memory because CPU doesn't have the storage. Storage is outside CPU, but CPU has to execute that. So it has to get it from the memory, execute it here, and send it back to the memory. But this memory is temporary. You withdraw the power and whatever program you have stored gets lost. So what you do, you use secondary storage, hard disk. There are different 
mechanical you know, mechanical parts. This also contains the same program, but this program stores permanently. Even if you take away the power, it recites. But it is very slow, so CPU does not directly touch this. They not directly get the program from here. This is first loaded here, and then the CPU gets it. We usually call this process. You know that, but still, I'm calling this is called loading. Some call it booting. Okay, so there are a lot of there is a particular program. It's not one program. Many programs load. There are many programs which are running currently. Program P1, P2. So there's a list of programs which is there in the memory. Out of that, there is one special program called operating system that helps other programs to execute. That is also residing in the hard disk, and that is first loaded into the memory, and that allows others to be loaded one by one. So the process of loading this operating system from the hard disk or the secondary storage to the primary storage is called booting. Okay, and once the operating system has booted, or that is has been loaded onto the primary memory. It allows other programs to one by one come from the hard disk and reside in it. And then CPU one by one executes. This is the machine that works. Okay, this is a minimum requirement of a computer CPU and a storage to hold them. Storage of two types. Okay, and um, storage of two types. One permanent and one temporary. Now, in addition to that, you also have two units. One is called the input unit, and the other one is called the output. Input unit is the one that provides the data. You said that the data has to be stored in the memory, but how will you get this data from the external world? Who will provide this data from the external world? So there are different interfaces or units that help to get this data and push it or store it in the storage devices. So the input unit will provide the data that will go and store in the storage devices. Similarly, after the processing has been done, there may be data which gets generated. That data will also be provided back to the external environment. User want to see that. So there is again an interface through which this will be passed on, and this is called output. So the output unit is the interface through which the data generated after processing will be sent to the external. Okay. Let's see the computer system. So all of you have definitely seen a computer. Have you ever opened a computer system? Anyone? No. Have you opened this? Anyone who has opened the computer and checked what is inside? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you relate to this figure that has been shown here? Yes, we can relate. Okay. This is called a motherboard, right? So, as the name implies, that's an the board on which all the components that we just discussed are you know placed so all the different uh, components that are there we just discussed about five units so all these units are placed on this board and together they work now let's have a look at each one of them this is the portion where you place your cpu okay so this is called the cpu socket and you see this is the cpu right the processor okay so this is the uh, computing unit 
that sits here and this in this board there's a particular socket where you can put your cpu then there are slots which are here so these are called memory slots so in this memory slots you see the red and the yellow ones they are the slots where you can put your storage devices and this is called this is the primary storage this is called ram okay random access memory what you do is you take them and you plug into these red or the yellow ones and then uh, internally they are connected so the memories that you put here they get connected to the they internally through this board it gets interfaced to the cpu right then in addition to that look at this this is the uh, secondary storage device which is a electromechanical component which is called a hard disk now here you have the connectors that connected to the hard drive okay so this is the uh, uh, mechanical part or electromechanical part which stores the data permanent okay now all these items that you find here they have to be powered so there needs to be a power source so here is a power supply that is going to be connected to this and that will provide the power to all these components here in addition to that you also have um, i told you there are four processors or four units that are used for computing different kind of floating point operations let's say so here we have uh, such a unit it is called a graphics card this in itself is a board okay so this in itself is a board and that's a plug and play kind of you take this board and you put it in this slot now this particular board that you plug in here it acts as a coprocessor so coprocessor means so it's like this here we have the cpu and here you have the graphics unit okay and they are connected so whenever a cpu needs such operations that should be done by the graphics unit it puts it to the the graphics processor and the graphics processor does that and sends the result back to the cpu so this is how it works okay and uh, so that is about it and now when all these units are there they have to be connected isn't it so if this is the cpu this is the memory and this is the and it it's the connection that we usually draw between two units that are not dedicated but actually they run through some kind of you know um, uh, supply line think in terms of the water supply that is there in your um, in your house so you have a pipe that that's for the electrical supply so that's a uh, electrical line that's a main line that is that runs all around and from there you tap and you take it uh, whenever you need anyone so this this is the uh, you know way in which the lines are there there are peripherals i mean so if you want to add some external peripherals you can do that and you can connect them so this is how it gets connected and this overall thing is packaged and put inside this cabinet this is the case so this is usually the view that we have of a desktop computer or computer system so a computer system overlays integration of a number of components processing unit uh, add on cards memory secondary storage devices power supply input output units so together they form the computer system that's again a wide view of the computer motherboard as you see this is the area where the cpu is to be so it's a socket that is already created you open that and the cpu is obtained you get you purchase the cpu separately take the cpu it's a chip take that chip you put it in that and you put the put back the the, the connector so it gets connected to the socket okay 
then we have connectors for the peripherals. You see, these are for the uh, microphone and the headphones. So these are connectors. These are for US uh, for Ethernet. For it is are USB ports. Then they are for the connecting the video sub video ports. Okay, connecting to the monitor, Ethernet ports, and there are a lot of them. So this together is the uh, the motherboard. Well, so what is the uh, function of a computer? A computer primarily does four functions. One is called data processing. We know that, so that's the main job of the computer to process the data. Process means you have to perform some operations, arithmetic, logical, okay? Then we have some control operations, right? So. Uh, control operations in a sense that, okay, if this happens, then do that or else do this. So that these are data control operations. Then there's a data movement. You have movement of data from memory to the processor, from processor to the memory, or from one uh, secondary storage device to the memory. So these are called data move. So computer has to do all this. So this is, these are primarily the functions of a computer. So you are aware of all that. Let's quickly go through that because today you just have, I will just introduce you to these concepts. Uh, we have the most important part, you can say the brain of this computer is the central processing unit. And what you have in the central processing unit is as already the name implies, it has to process. Here is the CPU. I told you this is the CPU slot. This is the CPU slot. And so the CPU is taken. Let's say this is a uh, chip provided by Intel, an i7 core processor, and this is put into this slot. And but the you know uh, on top of that you may have this uh, fan. Reason is when CPU executes, it generates a lot of heat. We'll talk about that later on. And it dissipates so much heat that the overall CPU may become stalled or it may stop functioning. So to prevent that, the heat that is generated during execution, after all, it's an electronic circuitry. So when the electronic circuitry works, it draws current and the entire circuitry, it gets heated up. So when it gets heated up, the heat that is generated should be dissipated or else the overall temperature of that particular chip will increase. So there must be a provision to dissipate the heat and the way to dissipate the heat is by applying a fan. So usually we have a CPU which sits here and there's a fan which is kept on top. This is the fan that you see. It's called heat sink or uh, something like this. And uh, so uh, the, the fan is on top of that and that dissipates the heat, okay? So what exactly is uh, inside the CPU? Well, inside the CPU, you have mainly the processing that is responsible for performing the operations. And this is called the arithmetic and logic unit. So if you look at the operations that a computer should do, the operations can be broken down into arithmetic operations and logical operations. So there is some unit that actually performs this stuff. Okay, so the unit that performs these operations is called the arithmetic. Now I told you that these operations that go on have to be done in this unit, but they have to be done in a sequential way or in an ordered way. So there must be someone who acts as a manager to control the sequence of operations. And this is called the control unit. This is called the control unit. Uh, now, the CPU performs this operations, that's fine. But before performing an operation, let's say it wants to perform some operation like C equal to A plus B. Okay? So this is the operation you have to do, addition of two data, addition of two data. So this arithmetic unit, this is the portion where 
this operation will happen. What is the operation? The operation is an addition operation. An addition will take place. Between what? Between two data. Where will that data be obtained from? Well, from the memory. The storage element, the data is there in the storage element. But when the data will be, uh, when, when you are going to work with the data, you cannot directly take the data from the memory and obtain this. When the data will be obtained from the memory, the CPU is here, the memory is here. Let's say the A and B is here. So you will be working with this A and B, and the ADU will be, or the arithmetic unit will be working on it. Fine, but the memory, after you read this two data from the memory, you have to temporarily store it inside the CPU as well, isn't it? Because this A and B, after you get them, so the A will be obtained here, the B will be obtained here, and then you will perform this addition operation. And then the result will be generated, okay? Then you will send it back. But after you read the data from the memory, and you want to execute it within the CPU, the data has to be temporarily stored. So there must be some temporary storage in the CPU as well. They are not as much as the memory, but they are some of the storage. So there are a few storage elements which are there in the memory, and they are called registers. So they are called registers, and these are storage elements. Okay. What are registers? You can view registers as storage elements of a particular size. Let's say this is a register. It's a storage. Okay. Let us call it a register. And the register is of a particular size. Let's say it is of 16 bit size. Okay. So the register is of 16 bit size or maybe 8 bit size. There are different kind of uh, um, sizes. 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, 128 bit. And uh, there are a finite number of registers. Okay, so there are a finite number of registers and these are storage within the CPU. So these registers are, uh, the, they are the registers. They are storage which is present in the CPU. The data that you read will be stored into the registers and then they will be provided to the uh, unit to perform the operation okay so this is overall the uh, storage elements in the cpu now along with that there is a memory also inside the cpu very interesting we just said that there is no memory inside the cpu but then we are saying oh there are registers there are storage elements as well there is also memory what are this memory? This is called a faster memory and it is called cache. We will talk about uh, extensively on this particular topic called cache. It is a faster memory which stores some portion of the program that you are currently executing from the external memory. Okay, so we just saw that uh, programs are residing in the external memory here, right? This is where your program is there. And your CPU is supposed to get one by one all of them and execute. But some portion of that, a portion of this program also resides here in this memory, which is inside the CPU. Now you may wonder why, is, why this is necessary. Now think it in this way. Suppose you are going to, you are asked to submit a project on the uh, some topic, okay? some topic you are being asked by your instructor to write a project report. You go to the library and there are a number of books you have to consult so that you can create that project report. Now you find that, okay, one by one, you are going to the shelf, you are looking up the book, you are finding which portion has to be written. And what you are doing is you are sitting on a table. Okay. So, you take all one book, come to the table, write that, put that book back, take another book, come to the table, write that. This is not a good thing. The better approach would be take all the five books that you need, bring them to the table and 
while you sit on the table, you can refer to all the five books and that will be quicker process because all the five books are there on your table. So think that the bookshelf from where you are reading the books are is the primary memory, the external memory. This, this one. And think the table is this particular memory, which is called cache. So if you are consulting currently five books, why to keep all the five books on the shelf? You know that you will be needing them. You bring them under the table and you refer to them. Okay. Another analogy could be you are planning to cook something and you need some vegetables. So you have to go to the market, bring them and then cook. But if you have those vegetables in your refrigerator, then it is easier for you to cook. You don't have to go to the market You save some time, right? So that refrigerator in this case is your cash. It's a memory that is there in your house. And the market in this case is the primary memory. So this is the concept that if I can have a faster memory inside the CPU and I can keep some part of the program inside that memory, because that memory is within the CPU, I don't have to go outside the CPU and fetch them. I will be getting them quickly because they are inside the CPU itself. This is the basic idea of a CPU. Okay. So overall, what we found is a CPU is the central processing unit that is responsible for processing the tasks. The main operations which involve are arithmetic and logical operations, which are done by a unit called ABU. The sequence in which these operations have to be done is controlled by a unit called control unit. In addition to these, there are a few internal storage elements present within the CPU called registers, which store. And there is a memory as well, which is called cache that stores some part of the program while executing so that it becomes faster. Okay. So that is what I have mentioned. The control is to control the operations of CPU and hence the computer. Arithmetic unit performs the computer's data processing functions, which involve arithmetic and logical operations. Registers, they provide the storage internal to the CPU. And there is an interconnection between them. So there is all these, there's a interconnection. Interconnection means they are connected. So the connection is not end-to-end. It's not like this is connected to this. And there's a central bus, sorry. There is a connection that runs all over this chip and they are connected here. It's like the tap line. Eh? So there's a pipeline that goes all around the locality and then from here everybody takes a tap and gets connected to the line. Okay. So this is overall the picture of the CPU. So if you look at um, the inside of the CPU, so that's the figure that uh, has been shown of the Intel's core i7 micro architecture. And uh, this is the uh, internal view of the chip, internal view of the i7 core. And you see, this is a multi-core architecture, four processors, four CPUs. This is one, two, three, four. Actually, it's called seven. Okay, but physically there are four. Now we'll talk about that later. Each core behaves as a two virtual core, so that is why the name zero to seven that stands for eight cores, and there are two virtual cores in each one of them. Physically, they are one. Physically, there are four, but overall, each of them can parallelly execute two programs. So it feels that there are two virtual cores. That is why it's called I7 architecture, or there are eight cores in total. Uh, um, so this is the figure that, uh, that shows the structure or the internal details of the multi-core processor. Okay. So you have four cores, you have a cache that is shared among all these. Then you have a memory controller. We'll talk about that. If you want to, if the processor is going to communicate to the memory, it is through a particular controller. The controller is responsible for sending and receiving the different data from the memory. That is also inside the CPU. 
we will talk about all this in more details let's move towards the second element which is called the storage elements and when i say storage elements you already have seen what is the job of this to store the program and the data so there are two kinds of storage primary memory the memory unit is used to store data and program and the cpu can work with this information which is stored in the memory okay so the one with which the cpu actually interacts is called the primary memory that is the reason why it is called primary because that is the one with which the cpu interacts they are semiconductor memories they are made up of semiconductor materials they are volatile volatile means if you take away the power it gets lost the random access memory this one these so cpu actually uh, interacts with the ram okay so that interacts with the ram you already have seen this you know in the when i was showing you the motherboard so there are slots where you put them and they get so this is where you load your program and data and this program and data is fetched by the cpu and executed okay in addition to that there are some read only memories that is usually present inside the cpu okay read only by the name itself it must be clear that you cannot write anything to that you can only read so whatever data is there it has been programmed and one time process that's all so usually we input a program called bios inside this rom basic input output setup when you turn on the computer there are a few programs that automatically start you don't have to do anything and that is the program that is loaded into this rom and the moment you turn on the power the cpu the processor it starts reading from whatever is written in this particular uh, rom okay that's the initial program that is read and this is called the basic input output setup it's a read only memory used for this kind of purposes now in addition to that read only memories have been have evolved and all they have been made programmable read only memories um, which can be program i mean it's not that the memory can be uh, it's only one time process you can program that according to your own way users can program that then there are erasable program memories where you can erase and you can reprogram them then electrically erasable depending on if you perform that erasing process to an electrical method so different variants of rom are also there we will talk about that later what is and how does memory look like what is the view that the computer gets of memory the memory is consisting of a millions of storage cells it's a storage after all so what you have is there are number of storage cells that are there and what you have in each memory is a bit which is storing either a zero or a one okay so you see this is the structure of a memory this is a view of the memory and you have um, memory can be viewed as an array of locations a number of locations and these locations what you have is each one of them that it stores a bit what is bit bit is called binary digit and when i say binary digit i mean it is either a zero or a one by the way zero and one are logical values they are logical values they actually mean a signal of a particular voltage level okay either it is a high voltage and this is a low so these are the logical values remember they are just just representations it's a zero or a one physically it actually means a high voltage or a low voltage okay so what you have in a memory is a data that gets stored okay. so every cell in the memory stores one single bit of information it is either a zero or a one zero means something one means something we'll talk about that later so information is stored in the form of binary digits physically they mean 
a high voltage or a low voltage. And there are a number of cells, not one, but many, many cells. Now, all these cells are grouped together to form a word, as you see here. Let's say there are n number of bits, and together they are forming a word. So, a group of n bit is called a word. Now, n may vary. I may have 8 bit word, I may have 16 bit word, I may have 32 bit word. Usually, we take powers of 2 because binary is 0 and 1, so it's already a, a system which uses only two possibilities. So, usually, we take powers of 2 8 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, 64 bit, uh, 128 bit. So, these are the different possibilities of grouping these bits. How many bits you are grouping to call it a word? So, memory overall, you can say, is a collection of words. It's a collection, but the collection is an organized collection. How it is organized? It is organized in the form of an array, where every there are in, in a form of a number of locations. So this is a location, and every location has an address. It's like you have your uh, locality and your house has an address. So if I have to send you some information, some letter, I will have to write the address on top of that. And that will help me in locating that particular house. It's similar. If you have to locate a particular data in your memory, some information that you store, you have to locate the address. So that is why it says memory is a collection of words, locations, you can say. And these locations are identified by an address. Unique address. Every location has an unique address. So let us say I say that, okay, this is my first word. My first word has a location number zero. My second word has a location number one. My third word has a location number two in this way. This is how you access the memory. Now, in addition to the primary memory, we also have secondary memories. These are devices that are uh, able to store data permanently. Okay. So they are able to store data permanently and uh, they are mainly electromechanical components. As you see, we have hard disks, optical drives, SD cards, floppy disks, which are outdated to be magnetic tapes. Again, they were used to be there, um, you know, 10 to 15 years ago or maybe 20 years ago. Now they are almost obsolete. They are not there. So overall, these were the different, you know, um, part, uh, the different kinds of devices that were used to store data. They are called secondary storage devices. Secondary storage means they are not the ones with which a CPU interacts. They are used to store data permanently, persistently, usually electromechanical parts. Very slow, but, but voluminous, can store a lot of data but very, very slow. So CPU does not directly interact with them. This data has to be transferred to the primary memory because from there, CPU can interact. Well, so we discussed about CPU, we discussed about memories. Now, how to get the data from the external environment or external world? They are obtained through input units. The input unit is the one that gives or provides the program and the data. And that is what is read into the main storage. So the input device gives you data that goes and stores in the storage elements. We have a number of such devices, mouse, keyboard, joystick, microphone. So something that should be remembered here is that input devices are of different types of different nature. The data that they provide is of different format. So that is the biggest challenge here. How can you design a system? How does the CPU or the memory be able to get the data coming from different varieties of varieties of devices? How does that happen? How is it that 
a mouse which is of a particular type of device the data provides that is also available to the computer keyboard light pen how how do these people or how do these devices can send the data to the same cpu how does the cpu understand different formats we will talk about that in a particular section of this course where we will understand the working of input output devices how the interfacing happens well if you get the data you also want to display the data or to provide the output of the processing so <clears throat> if you want to provide the results to a user you can do that via many such devices which are called output devices they are printer, monitor, headphones, screen projector, GPS location, plotter, video card, what not. So number of devices are increasing day by day and we are able to connect them. Well, now that we have understood how the computer, what is inside the computer, it's time for us to know how does the computer work? Hmm? So how does it work? Now, computer, it's, we've already seen, uh, its job is to help us in validating the solution that we have designed. The user is solving a problem. The user knows how to solve the problem. It devises a technique to solve the problem called the algorithm. And it writes the algorithm within the computer. The computer works, generates an output, given some input so the way to tell the computer to that this is the solution is what you call program so when i say computer needs to be programmed i actually mean whatever solution you have devised or whatever algorithm you have designed how do you tell the computer about that algorithm? so the way to do that is called program okay so an algorithm or a solution to your problem consists of a number of steps. Step number one, step number two, step number 10. And in each step, you are using some instruction. I want to I10. You are using 10 instructions in these 10 steps. So whatever solution you have designed or whatever algorithm you have developed has to be written in a stepwise manner. And in each step, you have to mention a particular instruction. This is called program. So programming is a process of writing instructions in a language that can be understood by the computer so that a desired task can be performed by it. You want this problem P to be solved? Fine. Develop a solution for that called A and check whether your solution is working correctly. How? Write the solution in a stepwise fashion. In each step, mention an instruction, instruction to the computer, and let these instructions be executed by the computer. If after the computer executes all these 10 instructions, you find that, yes, it is working correctly for an input, you are sure that the algorithm is correct, or the algorithm is correct. But the instructions that you are telling to the computer has to be told in a language that is understood by the computer. That is most important. You cannot tell the instructions in your way. You have to tell it in the way the computer can understand. Computer means that mechanical parts that the, the semiconductor machine that we talked about. So the program is a sequence of instructions to do the task and the computer will process each one of them one by one. Let's say this is the algorithm. I want to I10. You put these I want to I10 in the memory and you tell the processor, see, you execute I1 first, then I2, then I3 in this way, go on doing up to I10. So processor will execute one by one. But it will only execute if it knows the meaning of I1. So that means you should tell the processor in its language. What is the language? It is the language of binary, zeros and ones. So every instruction, I1, has to be written as, let's say, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. I2 has to be written as 0, 0, 0, 0. I, in this way, I10 may be 1, 1, 1, 1. So what you actually drop in a 
memory is 0, 01001000 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. in this way you go on 111 but see writing a program in this language is very difficult very very difficult it's very hard to remember can we have a better option than that we can what well, instead of this 0100, can I write it as add? Instead of this, can I call it as subtract? Here, can I call it as halt? What are these? They are called mnemonic. Mnemonic means some strings, some words I have designed, which will actually mean the same as the corresponding binary. So instead of this binary string, I'm using these words. They are called mnemonic. So the, the same program or the set of instructions I am writing using them. Let's look at an example. On the left hand side, you see this is an instruction set. Instruction set means the instructions that I have to use. Set of instructions. It is the set of instructions that can be used to write a program. Not write, not can, has to be. You have to use only these. You want to instruct the computer, you have to use this. There's an instruction called start. There is an instruction called read from a memory location. M means a memory location. There is an instruction called write to a memory location. There is an instruction called load data to a memory location. Copy one memory location to the other. Add two memory locations and store it in the third one. Compare two memory locations and put the result in the third one. Jump if you satisfy these two. Alt means stop. These are the instructions that you are allowed. Fine. I start writing a program. What I do? I start, that's the instruction that will tell me that, okay, my program starts. And this, these 0, 1, 2, they are memory locations. They are memory locations. Remember, what did I tell you? That you have to write a program and you have to put it in the memory. So it is location number 0 that I have put this instruction called start. In location number 1, I have put read location number 10 this is memory location what is the instruction read a memory location so i must tell read which memory location location number 10 that means it's like this location number one location number two location number three location number four five six seven eight nine ten 11, 12. So this will tell read 10. This is the instruction I will have in this. Then I'll have read 11. Then I'll have add 10, 11, 12. Then I'll write write 12 and all. This is the program. So instead of writing it in binary, I'm writing it in the form of memory. Fine. What the CPU will do? CPU will first read this. Oh, the first line will tell start. It understands that it's a start. Then it will read this. It will read read 10. It will know read 10 means I have to read data from location number 10. So there is a location number 10 where some data is written 5. So it will, after reading this line, it will mean that it has to read this line. That is, it has to read the location 10. So it will read location 10. Okay. So it will read this. Okay, so it will read location number 10. That is, it will read Five. Ah, 
So it will read five and then it will complete this. Then the same thing it will do, it will read this 11 and you add. So once it has read five, it will store it inside. Then it will move to location number 11. It will read the data stored there. Let's say it is a data called six. It will read it and store it in the registers. Then it will read the third one. So it has read this, it will third read this. It will find, okay, it is add. I have to add the content of 10 and 11. That means I have to add content five and six. It will perform that. Okay, so you see how the instruction, how my program, I am just adding two numbers. C equal to A plus B. A and B are two memory locations. I am adding them. But this small instruction is equivalent to these because I have to write them using these instructions and nothing else. This is the problem. So, if you write program using this instruction set, see how the instruction set writing the program using instruction set was difficult. Right? Because we are limited by only those number of instructions. Everything I have to use using them. And importantly, this instruction set will keep on varying. Same program, if I am using for this instruction set, this will lead to this kind of a program. If I change the instruction set, I will have a different program. If I change to a third instruction set, I will have a third kind of a program. Which means that if you change the instruction set, your program keeps on changing. That's a very difficult thing. But that is what happens because every CPU has own instruction set. Every CPU has an instruction set which is unique. So if you change, keep on changing the program, if you want to write, run the same program on different CPUs, you have to write different kinds of program. That's a very difficult thing. Can we have a more simplified solution than that? The solution is, can I develop my program in a language which is independent of the CPU? Independent of the CPU. That means the instruction set will be, I will not write it in the, directly in the instruction of the CPU. I will write it in a more abstract way and then convert it into the instruction of the CPU. So for language for that purpose is called a high level language. We have languages such as C, C++, Java, and so on, which are languages that are CPU independent, or I, should I say CPU instruction set independent. You are writing one program, okay? And that will be for all CPUs. You don't worry about that. But something that should be kept in mind is that ultimately, the program has to be in this particular form. Whatever program you write, you may write it in a, your own comfortable language, independent of CPU, but ultimately it has to be written in this particular form. So you see, this is the program that we have written, where we have made use of our own kind of syntax, variables, read X, Y, these kind of things. So it has helped us reduce the complexity of writing the program. I don't have to worry about the instruction set. I can write it in my own way. I just need to develop the logic and write it. But ultimately, the computer will not understand that. It has to understand this. So there must be some kind of a translation that needs to be done. And the translation is called compilation. The tool that does this is called compile. So this is responsible for converting a high level program to a low level program. Low level program means the program that the computer understands. So what are the steps for writing program? You write a program in high level language, say in C, you use a text editor. You are being shown the figure here. On the left hand side, this portion, you have used a text editor. This is the text editor. You wrote a program, save that in a 
file with .c extension, let's say hello.c. The moment you save that, what do you mean by save? When you save that, you actually create the program. Okay. And you put it in the secondary storage device. Okay. So you put it in the secondary storage. And the one that you put is identified by something called a file. So file is the program that you have created. And you have put that on the secondary storage device. Let's see. Hello.c. The source hello.c is stored in a folder called my first program. So this is the folder where you have put your file. Okay, that's what you have done. So you have saved that in the secondary storage permanently. Now you want to run that. You want to run that means the CPU will be running that. So to run that, you first have to convert that into a form that the CPU can understand. And the process to do that is called compilation. So you open up a terminal and what you type in is something like GCC, let's say hello.c. This you type. Hmm? Terminal is another program which is running on top of the OS. So you are making use of a program called terminal to use some functions provided to you by the operating system. One of them is the compiler program. And you are using the compiler program to compile this particular file, convert it into a form that is understood by the CPU. And what happens is there's a file called a dot out that gets created. Then we run this by typing in the command called dot slash. And this command tells you or tells the computer to execute. So this is the steps for writing code. So what are the steps that is uh, that goes on to write a program? You create your source file, okay, which is a .c file. The .c file may have some kind of let's say uh, libraries to be included. So they are pre-processed. Okay. Suppose, say for example, you have something like hash include stdio.h. So these are nothing but some kind of processor directives, which is, is run before the compilation process. So this software runs that, finds out the meaning. It pre-processes that. Pre-processing means it finds out what should be done. It understood, okay, what should be done? This file should be included. Searches the file, includes it. Then it converts it into an assembly code. So the compilation happens. The assembly code is generated. We just saw that this has to be compiled and a low level program has to be generated. Low level programs means the assembly. The assembly will be generated, which will be of the extension dot s. So a file dot c after compilation gives rise to file.s. Okay. Then the assembler converts it into a binary, which is called the object file, and it takes the form file.o. This is the object file. That is actually the translation of your code. But this code may not have information about functions that are defined here. So they have to be attached, and that is the role Played by the software called linker. So other objects that is files, modules, library files, relocation object file info, everything is attached to this object file. And what finally gets comes out is called executing. See, it's like file.exe that gets created. This is the step of compilation till here. Now, once the compilation is over, now you have to tell. So this is what has happened till GCC part, this part. Now, once the compilation is over, now you want it to run. You want the CPU to execute. Okay. So file.exe is created, but CPU has to execute this. How will the CPU execute? CPU will only execute 
if you can somehow put this file dot exe into the primary memory. So the file dot exe, which is still in the secondary storage device, has to be loaded onto the primary. Memory. And this is done by a program called Loda. So Loda loads it onto the primary memory. And then CPU fetches that one by one from the primary. This is what happens. See? So the program, after the executable file has been created, it gets loaded onto the primary memory. And look at this. This is the from here to here, this is the portion of the memory that is occupied by the program. So the range of locations which this particular program is occupying is called address space. The range of locations occupied by the program when the program gets loaded into the memory, it's called address space. All these are locations starts from some location X and goes up to let's say some X plus Y. So all these locations are filled up. This is the program which is sitting in the primary memory. What is this? Well, this is another program that is sitting beyond this and it is called the kernel. This is the operating system. There is another program which is residing in the primary memory and this will help the CPU to execute this program. How? We'll talk about that later. This is overall the loading of the program and how the program gets executed in the memory. Okay. So this is the memory layout of a C code. On the left hand side, you are shown how a C code looks like. And on the right hand side, you see after it has been loaded. There are a lot of things that goes on once it gets loaded onto memory. So today we shall stop it here. Today what we discussed is um, the basic idea of a computer, the components of a computer, and what happens when a program gets executed. What are the steps involved in compilation of a program and how a program is stored in the computer. So that is an uh, introduction about the particular uh, course and how to start off with. From uh, next class, I'll talk about what happens after the program gets loaded and how we'll be talking about how we'll be relating the execution of a particular program to the internal working of the computer. And that will give us a picture. What happens when a program runs? What are the components of a computer and how they work? Because that is only, uh, only then we'll be able to understand the working of the computer. And then we'll subsequently think, okay, if I have to build a computer, how to do that? So that is about it for today's lecture.